go with me, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6. Somebody was telling me this morning, I, I, I'm sure I haven't uh, done a, as good a job as I need to about keeping everybody up to speed on testimonies as they come to me regarding our faith promise pledge process. Because, you know, we want to, at 25th anniversary year, we want to give ourselves a 25th birthday present, and that is to pay off the mortgage on this church. And we ask you to make pledges, not a capital campaign, a consecration campaign. And so do it as a faith promise. And so a number of you, may, I will say maybe the majority of you even, looked at it and said, okay, God, give me a number. And if you haven't done this yet, there are cards scattered throughout this building. Do that. Fill out a card and turn it in. God, give me a number. I'll, I'll be obedient to write it down, and then I will trust you by faith. Over the course of this year, you will bring it in. So we had one family do that, and it was, you know, to them, outrageous numbers. Like, I have no idea how this is going to happen. So they said, well, I know, you know, at last Sunday, Ellen talked about April 15th being Give It All Sunday. Meaning on that Sunday, we're, we're going to take our tax return and give it all. Now, you may be saying, you know what, My, actually, how about this, Alan? Because you said, you said Pastor Grace did it, where he did a Give It All Sunday, where people gave an entire paycheck. And that's less than my tax return. Okay, give that. Get, find something besides your lunch money you can give all of on Give It All Sunday, April 15th. So I said, okay, we'll do the tax return. Then they did their taxes and found out they owe money. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that's out the window. Well, it turns out, having interviewed for a job some weeks ago, you know, lo and behold, weeks later, now, now get offered the job, and it's a, it's a tremendous boost up in pay. And it's like, God stepped in. That takes care of that. And you know what? I'm... I'm cake right now, but let me tell you why I'm cake not right now. It's not just because of that. I'm cake right now because we had three kids saved in the detention home ministry this last week. Amen. That is why at this time of, of choosing deacons again, which we try and do every two years, it's, it's been three this last time, but every two. Uh, that is why at this time our thesis for today's study is this. There's a crucial and critical connection between a person's spiritual life and their financial life. Money is important no matter how much you have. But if you, the more you have, then it is muy importante. <laughs> Zig Ziglar said money isn't everything, but it's right up there with oxygen. <laughs> and yet Henny Youngman once said, I have all the money I need if I die by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So I don't see why you're not getting that because we all need help when it comes to money and finance. So there's some things, since we are the new Corinthians, as Americans, and we got it like that. Uh, let's take this Sunday. And I want to be po as positive as Paul. And we want to teach you how to know and enjoy high rolling. How to live like a high roller. I mean, we are, you need to be, these men on our list and you need to be the big baller, shot caller, number one stunner in this city. So let me give you an experiential exegesis of rolling like a high roller and, and explore your experience for an explanation of what this means. First off, notice if you will, rolling with the high rollers means, number one, you do not live from paycheck to paycheck, but you do give from paycheck to paycheck. How, number two, by giving God the first dime out of every dollar. That's tithing. Then instead of being so stingy with God, you learn to live off the rest. It's not like you even miss it. And when that's done by faith, we're already telling you the testimonies of how God steps in. Number three, give generously to ministry that you're involved in without shorting God his 10%. So wait, 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 wait. Wait, you cannot rob Peter to pay Paul and then hold, up, then hold up Peter and Paul to pay Barnabas. So, so in this, here's the reason why nobody does it like we're doing it in our 25th anniversary year. And everybody, all the church growth gurus say, 
oh, you got to have a capital campaign and, and then you got to follow that up with another one and you'll just be in continuous capital campaigns from now on. on. And, and we have pre-built, pre-formatted form letters that you can send out to guilt people into giving money. Uh, and you have to do it that way because otherwise it's a zero-sum game. It's zero-sum, meaning your pledges will go up, but your regular offerings will go down. All right. We're going to find out, are we a zero-sum body of Christ or not? Are we Wakanda or are we just Kansas? Uh, because if you rob Peter to pay Paul, nobody gets paid. Amen. If you slide your tithe... To take the place of your pledge and you short God his 10%, I don't have the money to pay salaries. Now, now you be my accountability and you check me out in this. Because I gave everyone employed by this church a Christmas bonus and a raise. So everybody else is going to get paid even if I don't. I'm just telling you. Everybody else will get paid even if I don't. Uh, it will not be zero sum. Uh, where one account goes up and the other goes down. Because if you, e even if you play games with your boss, the IRS, your spouse, or me, that's one thing. But I do not play games with God over your giving. Amen. That's why to be considered a deacon, you can't do less in the age of grace than God commanded in the Old Testament. And, and if someone is so stingy, that is a crucial connection between their spiritual life and their financial life. So we don't appoint them to that level of leadership. So then on the other hand, rolling like a high roller, this number four means you live free of unsecured debt. So the rest of your life can be the best of your life. You say, Alan, how do I get there? You're asking good questions this morning. If you are number five, free from the lure of advertising and the pull of materialism, so you're not susceptible to impulse buying. That is how you get there. But that means, number six, you learn to be content instead of covetous by being focused on what you already have. And I know I done not stop preaching today and I went to meddling. But God's goal for you uh, uh, eventually is number seven, to have enough money and savings to cover your living expenses for three months or more. I believe God's desire and design is for people in Christ's body to live that kind, that quality, that caliber of spiritual life. So the question from the platform today is this, as you reflect on your finances, are you gaining or are you losing? Now, now, don't tell nobody. Are you gaining or are you losing? Don't tell nobody, just, just write in the corner of your outline. If you're getting better, write a real sm uh, small up arrow. R write an up arrow real small. If you're, if you're worse, write a down arrow. If, if it's a person next to you frustrating your finances, write the arrow in their direction. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know what you're saying. Alan, I don't know who told you my business. But since you're already in my business, don't let me leave till you tell me how to handle my business before I go out of business. And I'd be glad to help you out. Let me unpack some principles from our prime passage today. Let me take you to our text. First Timothy chapter 6. Paul says you need riches so you can enjoy everything. Watch, verse 17, verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world. Stop. All of us in this place are considered rich both by biblical standards and global standards, so Paul is writing to us. If you own your home, if you have heat and air conditioning, if you have a means of transportation, if you get a raise in salary, then in terms of wealth, you are the top 15% of people on this planet. If you got two cars and two salaries and multiple changes of clothes, like all the ones you filed through in your closet today, you just jump to the top 5% of people on this earth, that means 95% of the people on this planet are doing worse than you. So we are the rich in this world. Just tap your neighbor and say, I knew you had money. I knew you had money. But notice very quickly that the text does not teach that it's wrong to be rich. Here's our first point for study. We've got to be careful how we control our money and that our covetousness and discontent does not control us. So can I take a teaching moment right here?
God wants you to prosper. He wants you to be wealthy as long as your money and your material does not own you. So what must we command those who are rich, Alan? Watch, verse 17, that they be not high-minded. Because there's some people you almost hate to see God bless them because as soon as God promotes them, they get all arrogant and stuff. Can't remember when they were struggling. Can't remember where they come from. And especially can't remember who they borrowed money from. So, so that's why grace, grace is so good at keeping us all even. Here's our second point for study. Grace keeps us even and promotes true fellowship because it enables us to remember how, how nothing we have is tied to the greatness of who we are, but to the goodness of who God is. John Nelson said, I'm having a hard time these days reconciling my net income with my gross habits. Gross materialism makes us forget God's mercy. So low is the way to go. So that we do not, verse 17, trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Don't be guilty about enjoying good things as long as you didn't rob God to get them or hold out on him while you have them. Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, you know what? Nothing else has to happen today for you to enjoy it. And you got to say like Paul, if I don't feel happy, I'm going to read myself happy, pray myself happy, think myself happy. Since God has been so good, i got to enjoy what God's given to me. So can I take a teaching moment right here? There are three reasons that you may not enjoy your stuff. First letter A, you're not there to enjoy it. You go from the full-time job to the half-time job to the kids' sports venue, you're never there. Letter B, we compare it to what somebody else has. Stop looking at his spouse or her spouse. So can I tell you something as a man and just be honest with you, single sisters in here, can I be honest with you, single sisters? Every man looks better than he is from a distance. So you need to nix the remix and start work, working with that busted brother that the Lord allowed you to marry. And if you view it providentially, invest as much energy in your own man, he'll look better and better as the days go by. Third letter C, we let others make us feel guilty. Yes, we went to the club, and we did a few things we had to repent of. But you got right a long time ago, and the Lord blessed you, because you got that degree. You know, and you know what? If you're tithing, you're supposed to be blessed. Amen. It's supposed to come back to you when you trust God like that. Right. So here's our third point for study. You should enjoy riches for the same reason you tithe, 10% off the top of your income. Because it is a recognition that you know it is God who gave it to you. Amen. So God gives us all things richly for our enjoyment. Uh, enjoying everything God gives you. Uh, as, you, as he is giving it to you, is, is glorifying to him. Uh, but here's what's going to mess you up. When God elevates your standard of living, it is so he can raise your standard of giving. Amen. How'd you miss that all these years? Watch, verse 18, I'm all up in the text today. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. That means ready to share. Can I tell you what righteous high rollers know? Righteous high rollers know that somebody can take what you have, but I can't take what you gave. Amen. Oh, the government may take what you have. It can't take what you gave. Hello, somebody. Uh, that's why Paul quotes Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than receive. So my goal for you in 2018 is let's operate with a high roller mindset because real living grows out of biblical giving. So what do we need to roll like a high roller? Anybody want to hear this? Just say, put jalapeno on it, Alan. <laughs> And I'll even take silence as consent because, you know, the buzzword in church growth is we got to grow smaller in order to grow larger. I never did understand that. Uh, our biblical buzzword is scatter seed in order to increase fruit. 
And in order to do that first, I need you to know, this is number one, you need a unique source. Let the whole church say God. If you think you own your home today, here's what you do. You go home, you walk around that house, and then you start to figure out how, how long has the dirt been there that your house is sitting on. Uh, then ask yourself, do I really own this place or I'm just a temporary tenant? See, truth be told, you got title, but the title just tells you you are a tenant right now. If you want to know who owns it, come back in 200 years. But wait a minute, Alan. I know people are not even connected to God, and they got plenty of stuff. Well, that's right. You can accumulate stuff without God. You cannot be blessed by it without God. Uh, truly, the wicked do prosper, but you can't be blessed by it. And whenever God finds someone he can trust, a person he can depend on, somebody not saying me, me, but thee, thee, then God plays Robin Hood. And he robs the treasures of, the, of iniquity to give, give to you because you're involved in ministry. God is the source. Second, on the other hand, this is number two. You need a ne unique subscription. Let the whole church say faith. faith. We are subscribers. Those who subscribe to this message of faith promise, they find while God owns everything, he entrusts to us some things. God has given you something. Nobody who attends here shouldn't participate in some way in our faith promise pledge. Because God's given you something. You, and you ought to leave church every Sunday saying, what will God do with me this week? Amen. What, what uh, Lord, what will you do with me today? Everything that was here before you got here is going to stay here. Except for what you send ahead by putting the eternal word of God in the eternal souls of men and women. So stay woke and write that down because God warned the people of promise in Deuteronomy 8. You can see on your handout, verse 17, thou, uh, uh, thou say in thine heart my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me all this wealth. But thou shalt remember, you need to remember, I need you to know the Lord thy God you need to remember, you do it by tithing. Here's how, here's how you remember it, by tithing. You remember, it is he that gave you the power to get that wealth. Let me open a window on that word. There was a man who sat in the, in the third row. He sat in the third row. He said, I don't care what Alan says. Uh, I worked hard for mine to get mine. I'm going to keep mine. So the man put in his will. He said, the day I die, I want my wealth to be split up between three people I trust, my pastor, my lawyer, and my doctor. And being reputable and reliable persons, then they were each given one-third of the man's assets at his death with instructions to file by the casket after he was funeralized and drop the money into the coffin before it was shut. It amounted to a million dollars each. So the doctor came forward. He walked by the casket. He's crying profusely. He dropped a full envelope in the casket. The lawyer came next. He's solemn and reverent. And he looks at his friend and then drops a full envelope in the casket. The pastor's the last one out because you know we always are. We're the last one out. But the other two were watching. Make sure that it was all done right. He walks by the casket. He places his envelope right on the man's chest. Casket was closed, pole barriers carried out, and, 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 and after the committal, it's put in the ground, the casket is covered. So after the funeral, the friends met together to eat fried chicken and potato salad. <laughs> and to compare notes on what happened. Doctor says, look, I have to admit, I'm, I'm so burdened by my guilt, but I gave that man free samples all the time. I thought he owed me something, so I took $200. I only put $999,800 in the casket. Lawyer took a swig of iced tea, said, I'm so ashamed of you. Said, since I'm not under oath and not testifying against myself, I need you to know he owed me $5,000 because I'm the one who had to set this thing up and I had to get my retainer and my fees someplace. So I only put $995,000 in the casket. And the preacher exploded. He was absolutely indignant. He said, I am so ashamed of you. He trusted you. 
You promised him. How could you let him down this way? So they both looked at the pastor. They said, well, Rev, how much did you put in the casket? <laughs> he said, I put the whole million dollars in there. I said, you sure about that? He said, yes, I am. I deposited the whole million in my bank account and wrote him a check, and it is sitting on his chest right now. <laughs> and I see why you didn't get that, because you don't write checks anymore, but... But there are no glove compartments in a hearse. There are no hitches on, on the back of a hearse for a U-Haul trailer. So the tithe reveals whether or not you are subscribed in faith. It shows whether you have your stuff or your stuff has control of you. It proves whether God is first or just an afterthought. Deuteronomy 14 talks about that. Watch, verse, starting verse 22, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase. Of, now this has never been um, superseded in the New Testament. Paul says, since that's the baseline, that's the floor of what you give, then give above that as the Lord leads you. But you'll tithe of all the increase of thy seed. Church was based on the synagogue. Everybody did this at the beginning. Uh, uh, that the field bringeth forth year by year, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And the, and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy, thy, check this. They shall come and eat and be satisfied because you tithe. That the Lord God, thy God may bless thee in all thy work of thine hand which thou doest. You don't give it to the immigrants and the orphans and the widows directly. God says you bring it to my house so it brings them into me. It brings them to the light. It also gets them the gospel. So here's our fourth point for study. The tithe is the test God administers to see if you fear him and he's first. It's also God's plan by which his ministers are fed. God's ministry reaches the least and the left behind of our community and does it in such a way it brings them to the gospel. So let's talk about in the final analysis, how high rollers roll. God is the source, we are his subscribers, and then in the final analysis, you must choose to have, number three, you must choose a unique stewardship. Verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life, abundant life, seed sown that produces everlasting life. Listen, two years from now, if the financial foundation gets destroyed, you better grab hold of your abundant life in Christ. God gives you that opportunity. He says it is through your choices you will either get the benefit or reap the consequence. You can lead a life of debt or you can choose to manage what God gives, walk into the more blessing God has for you. The problem is we want to do what we want to do and still expect God to fulfill his promise to us. Now, I'm not telling you what to think right now. I'm telling you what I know. Because I've been sitting right where you are, uh, listening to some preacher talk about tithing, about being obedient to God and how it will bring blessing. And I came up with every excuse you have and two more you ain't, you ain't even thought of. Then I started getting mad every time the preacher talked about anything about money, not just tithing. And the Lord said, you know, the problem is not what's coming from the pulpit. The problem is what is not coming from you. How long are you going to do it your own way? God says, test me. I beg you, test me. You can prove me in this. A lot of faith promises, a lot of, a lot of word of faith things. You can't really even apply in this dispensation. That, that, you know, dumb stuff people say. But God says, no, you can test me on this one. Yeah. Amazing thing is, if you recognize God as a source, if you believe you are a subscriber, if you see God as the steward of what you own, he says, I'll not just bless what you gave, I'm going to bless it all. Okay, you missed that. Let me be kind and rewind. 
You gave me some, that's blessed in ministry. But the part I leave with you is not going to go farther than you could have taken the whole amount. So I don't just bless what you give. I bless it all. Watch Philippians 4.15. In the beginning of the gospel, Paul says, When I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me, shared an offering as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye say once and again unto my necessity. Not because I, watch, not because I desire a gift. I didn't send out letters demanding it from you. I desire fruit because it's going to bound to your account. When you scattered seed by giving it to me, you increased your fruitfulness. That's what I want, Paul says. Here's the promise. Do you believe it by faith? Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So I challenge you to take action today. The first act is to start with God first and give him the tithe. Just tithe. Just 10%. Pay him every time you get paid. Nobody ever went bankrupt for 10%. But you might go bankrupt if you don't. Action items. Number one, commit all you own to God. Number two, decide to give your full tithe to the church so you can step out of the place of disobedience and into the place of blessing. Number three, get a plan to get out of debt. We talked about that two weeks ago. You can find it in the sermon archive under the live tab on our website menu. My time is up. I thank you for yours. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian pray. Pray for your neighbor today because everybody in here needs help. And you know, uh, this is a Sunday we, you know, unroll a set of names and ask how we can make adjustments to it. And it's not a matter of what other people think. It's only a matter of what God knows. And help is available today. Because God owns it all, he's calling you today to be a subscriber. Become a subscriber by faith by getting saved today. Billy Graham just passed last week. I haven't put nothing on Facebook because everybody else is. Everybody has their picture with Billy Graham. I have a picture with Golden Davis of us down on the, on the field at Arrowhead the last time Billy Graham was here in Kansas City. Because I came to Christ through Billy Graham. I got saved at 11 years of age. When I watched him preach a, a TV crusade, and he preached that night and told me how I could have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what I wanted. I was, a, I was afraid of dying. I'd been to a funeral by then. It didn't seem right it should be me in that casket for, for no good reason and just, just nothing, go to nothing forever. And he told me how I could have a turn. God offers eternal life in Jesus Christ. And so when Billy Graham asked people to bow their head, even on that telecast, I, I bowed my head at 11 years of age and I prayed. And my grandparents weren't watching him the next night, so I went downstairs on our little nine-inch black and white TV, and I watched it again. I prayed again for good measure, and I, and I got the address, and I wrote off to him, and, you know, he sent me back a Gospel of John and all of that, and they had the prayer in there, and I prayed again for good measure. Amen. Become a subscriber by getting saved. Go ahead and, go ahead and stand don't have to grab hands with your neighbor if you've been sick, but go ahead and stand. Subscribe by faith so you can receive God's grace in Christ Jesus. God's offering to save you today, and by that he means he will forgive all your sins and give you eternal life. And check this, because I know some of you are saying, well, Alan, that's no good. He'll forgive me my sins, and I know me. I'll walk out of here, and I'll just commit them all over again. No, you don't understand. You don't understand. We're talking about God. The blood of Jesus Christ is so effective, it covers your sins past, present, and future. 
Because God looks at you right now. He doesn't see who you are. He sees who you could be in Christ. So in that sense, it doesn't matter. You, you think, you feel like you'll go out and just commit them all over again. No, give God your life. Faith, trust, and an application of the crucified life will solve every problem that you have because, of the, because it's all based on the finished work of Christ. The Word of God will do the work if you trust in the finished work of Christ. So after we pray, if you need any help, come here to the front. And if, and if you pray and trust Jesus today, come let me know so I can give you a copy of my book, Next Steps for New Believers. Father, we thank you today. Lord, I thank you. What a great day. What a great Sunday. What a fantastic, impactful thing when we consider your word, and especially those parts we know are written directly at us. So God, I pray for anyone in here who may not yet be saved. Lord, here's Billy Graham, almost 100 years of age. I think he was Methuselah. Lord, surely the rapture yeah. <laughs> is now ready to take place. Yes, but God, if there's anybody who's not yet saved, they ain't, they're not ready for that. So Lord, help them trust you today. Just pray, say, God, save me for Jesus' sake. I trust Jesus today for eternal life. I want to do it just like Alan talked about, how he did at 11 years age. I want that eternal life for me. I don't want to stay in that casket or that urn for eternity. I want to hear the trumpet voice of Jesus saying, come up hither and, and rise from the dead. Uh, and, and when I die, I want my soul and spirit to go and be with him right now. So, Father, we thank you today for your word. We ask that you would continue to make us into the church you absolutely want us to be. Because, Lord, if we can be a disciple-making church, we'll be a missionary-sending church. Yes. We'll be an evangelistic church. So, God, we turn these things all over to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.